Thank you. Most of you know me at this point. I'm Jane Eliasoff. I'm the executive director here at the Montclair History Center, and welcome to our history at home um, about herbs. And we all know that the reason we're doing this about herbs is because we've got a herb sale coming up very soon. It starts on May 5. It runs through May 8. Even if you don't have a pre-order in, no problem, come and shop because we'll have lots of good smelling and tasting things out there. Um, just a reminder that if you would like to make a donation to the Montclair History Center, you can do it on Venmo. You can do it by sending a note to 108 Orange Road, um, along with a check, preferably. Um, and you can do it on Zelle and you can do it on our website. So all of those ways um, you can um, donate to the Montclair History Center and let us know that you do appreciate these, do, these programs that we're doing. Um, I am going to cut right to the chase and move to an introduction to our speaker today, who is Deb Ellis, who is a Montclair resident um, and a wealth of information um, about all sorts of plants, not just herbs, but also um, native plants. So if you have any questions that you want to save on native plants for the end, you can do that. Um, I went to one program that she did, a webinar she did for the Native Plant Society, and I was so excited about the possibilities, um, and I'm sure she's going to do the same with us here today with herbs. Thank you so much, Jane. Um, I really appreciate being um, able to do this, because for me, going to the Montclair Herb Sale is a rite of spring. I just love the Montclair Herb Sale and going there every year, and I actually grow a lot of herbs that come back that are perennials, um, but there's a few that are annuals that you can really only find at the Montclair History Center. So uh, I have lots of gratitude for you doing this sale every year, and I'm really happy that I can um, hopefully help people get educated about the herbs that you will be offering. I do think it would be good if everyone can mute right now, just it improves the Zoom connection too. Um, and what I will do on questions is I have a slide about midway through that was a question slide I will unshare and take questions then and I will also take questions at the end it's probably easier if you can um, write down a note on your question instead of putting in the chat um, but if you want to put in the chat you can but I just wanted to tell you about my plan there then we can um, it's sometimes harder to go through the chat and I will be watching the chat anyway Deb so that if there okay, are great. questions I can move them in I can tell you them Fantastic. So, um, I am a certified master gardener and I am the founder and leader of the Essex County Native Plant Society. I mostly speak about native plants. Herbs are the exception because um, I think they're so special to grow. And as Jane said, I will talk a little bit about native plants towards the end, but I'm really going to concentrate on the herbs. I suggested this talk to Jane last year because I felt that it could augment and be a little service to the History Center to educate the custom customers about them. So I hope that everyone here learns something. I know many of you grow herbs from talking to you in advance. Um, and I'm not gonna, I'm gonna go in depth on a good number of herbs here, but certainly the History Center sells way more than these. So here's the plan um, is first, I'm gonna give some general info about using herbs, why I like them. Um, how to preserve them and how to use them. And then I'm going to talk in detail about six perennial herbs. Perennials are, are plants that come back every year. That's really cost effective for the consumer. Um, and then there's four annual herbs. Those are ones you have to grow every year. And then there's five edible flowers, which I think are really cool to know about that are herbs. And some of them I think Jane's going to have this year. I know it's a little uncertain what's going to be actually for sale, but most of these are things that she's had at least in past years. Okay, so why do I love to grow herbs? Uh, for people who are just thinking about growing edibles, I do think that herbs are the easiest and most cost-effective thing. They're very easy to grow um, and they're cost-effective because if you have a recipe that needs calls for herbs, you have to go buy a bunch of them. And a lot of times you only use a little bit and the rest go to waste. And they can be a little on the pricey side, but if you grow them yourself, you just walk to your deck or your backyard and you can just pick them. It's just, I feel like such a wonderful thing of life. They don't need a lot of space. In general, they don't need very much care and they're very nutritious. Um, this is not a nutrition workshop. I'm not an expert on that. But I can tell you that many of our foods, many of our um, edibles 
our vegetables have been hybridized to be sweeter for the American palate. And in the process of doing that, they've taken out some of the nutrients. But the herbs, because they are supposed to be, you know, have a strong taste, they have not been hybridized. Um, and so, yes, some of them have this bitter, sour taste that we want, and that is um, known to be more nutritious. So I like to add herbs for the nutrition too. I really try to eat um, a high nutrient diet. That's what I focus on rather than some other diet. I've just, I try to have the most nutrition I can. More reasons to love herbs are someone spoke in the beginning about how the deer don't eat them. And indeed, most herbs are animal resistant, again, because of their pungent taste. An exception I found in my garden is parsley. Parsley is not pungent enough to deter the rabbits. I think it's the rabbits that eat them, um, eat it. So I put my parsley under a high cage. Um, but the deer don't eat them generally. The groundhogs don't eat them generally. I have, you know, I live in Montclair in a, a very urban street, but we have deer walking down, we have groundhogs. And that's a nice thing. You can grow a lot of herbs and the animals will not eat them. And then they also have a very long season of use. My chives and lovage are already, I've already been using chives and my lovage is ready to use. So that's really early from April and then all the way through December where you can still be harvesting sage and rosemary for your um, Thanksgiving and Christmas meals. I do want to say that there, you could do a whole workshop about herbs and medicinal uses, and I am not qualified to do that. But I do believe in this quote, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. That's what I said before. I try to have nutrient dense eating and incorporating herbs into your diet helps with that. So I'm um, getting started tips. The first tip I have is very relevant to the Montclair History Center sale, which is to go for seedlings rather than seeds. You can grow these, some of these from seeds, but you often only need one or two plants. So I urge you to support the Montclair History Center and buy their plants. Another thing is grow what you like to eat. It's kind of obvious, but sometimes people don't think about that. What are the things you like to eat? Um, and you know, like chives are such a nice thing. Most people like a, a gentle onion flavor. Um, most people like mint. Um, so those are easy things to grow. You can enrich your soil with compost or worm castings if you want to, but a lot of herbs will grow without enriched soil. Um, but if you want to do a little soil amendment, that's what I'd recommend. I don't think they need fertilizer. And in some cases, fertilizer um, will not be helpful. I'll point that out in individual cases. It is good to have six to eight hours of sun. Most herbs do not do well in shade, um, but again, I'll point out those that will do better with some shade. In general, they do need good drainage. Don't part, um, don't plant, I don't plant my herbs or my sun pump comes out. I plant other natives there that like wet. Um, and you you know, many of them will grow in a pot, which is really nice for people who don't have a lot of space or you can put them on pots on your deck, even if you do have space, because it's nice to have them close to the kitchen. I have an herb, um, like a little uh, planter on my deck so I can run out and get a few things. And then I have some more in my garden. And so that's that last tip there to put close to the kitchen. Um, I think it's nice to mix herbs in your flower garden too. Um, flowers attract, uh, attract pollinators and then those pollinators will help um, pollinate the herbs and also the other things you're growing in your garden. The Montclair History Center's herb garden is a really nice example of a design, by the way. So how do we use herbs? I will talk individually about that too, but I wanna give some overalls, um, pointers. Um, one thing I think is herbs enable you to be creative. If you are growing them, you can just think of ways to, to add them to things. So here's an idea that I did once where I put water, I had a watermelon and cucumber, the essence of summer salad, and I added chives and mint to it to give it a little pizzazz. pizzazz. No special recipe, just was a really nice thing to mix in the, um, the savory of the onions and the sweet of the mint. People also like to add mint to dessert things, like to just watermelon as a fruit salad. Here's some really, just a list of all the different ways you can use herbs from, with roasted veggies, with eggs, with herb spreads, vinegars. 
So, the, and I'll talk in, um, for individual herbs about some other ideas, but just to look at all the different ways you can use them from savory to sweet. You could make them like lemon verbena is really good as a sweet bread. You can put rosemary in shortbread. Um, so even the ones that don't think of as sweet herbs can flavor cookies. Another really, really important point that I learned from a friend of mine, an old colleague in the law field who was a great cook too, who is a great cook, is the substitution principle. So you can often substitute one soft herb for another. It may seem strange, but it they do have a little different flavor. But if you can, if you if the recipe calls for parsley and you don't have it, you could try putting in basil or lovage or mint. So all the soft herbs can often be substituted and all the woody ones can often be substituted. Your oregano, your sage, your rosemary, and your thyme. Um, so those are just um, really kind of permissions to use herbs as freely and creati creatively as you can think of. And it just makes the summer a really fun time of year. Now, people often wondered also how to preserve them. Well, first of all, use them. Oftentimes herbs, the more you snip them, the more you grow, the more they get bushy and healthy. Um, so don't be afraid, don't save them, use them. Here's an example of how to store in the fridge. This is some lovage in a jar with water and plastic over it. That is a really great idea for storing lovage or parsley. Um, basil should not go in the fridge. It should be out on the counter. Um, and then to dry for winter, you can just hang them up and dry them, or I actually just lay them on cookie trays flat and put them in a dark closet and they dry very nicely. The woody herbs dry the best, and then I crumble them and I put them in jars and I make my own mix of all of them. The herbs, herbs de deb, you know, my herbs of God, Godfrey Road. You can also freeze some of them for winter. So this is an example of freezing chives in um, uh, a little container. I have to say they're gonna be watery when you, um, unfreeze them so they wouldn't be good for a salad, but they would be nice for a soup. You can also roll tightly into a log, parsley or chives. I have not done that myself, um, but those are ideas. I think the best way to freeze them is in like pesto. So basil to make pesto, I make a lot of pesto and freeze it and it is wonderful. And I'll talk more about that when we get to basil. Okay, now I'm gonna go into the individual perennial herbs, beginning with chives, which are up right now um, and ready to be used. Um, and I do put compost on them in the spring because think of it, they're coming up every year and producing food for me. So once they are established even, I think it is good to give them some help along the way. Chives are uh, one of the herbs that can grow in sun or some shade. They have a very long season. You only need one pot of them, they will expand. For those of you who want to try something um, in addition to what you already have, chives would be one of my top recommendations. I think they have a lot of uses from being, um, you could put them on as a garnish or inside eggs or tuna salad, egg salad, chicken salad, so many things. They're very easy to harvest and cut them with a scissors. I cut them at the base, fold them in half and then cut them, um, cut them quickly. So it's really easy to um, cut them. You all, they also, like you can see in this picture, they do have purple flowers early in the season and the flowers are a little stronger than the stems. And you can also put those into salads or eggs. You can use the flowers too. There's a better picture of the, how the flowers look. So they'd be very beautiful and those are edible. The stems with the flowers on are kind of woody. I usually throw those away and just use the flowers, but the rest of the chives will keep growing. So lovage. If there's one thing you remember from this workshop that you don't didn't know before, it's please try lovage. I love lovage. It is hard to find and the Montclair History Center sells it every year. I hope Jane is selling it this year. Um, they've never not sold it. You only need to buy one plant. This is how it's looking right now. Again, it's a perennial. It's up very well already. I bought one plant several years ago and I've dug it up a few years, a few times already, divided it and given it to more people. 
I also buy more just from the History Center to give as presents. This is a great present to give to someone because they never have to buy celery for the rest of their life in the summer if they have love it. So it tastes like celery with notes of parsley. I think it tastes a little more interesting to me than celery. Um, and I use it in all those summer salads, the tuna salad, the egg salad, the chicken salad, the potato salad. Um, I don't buy celery. I, um, use it. I use the leaves. I think the stems are a little tougher and they're good for soups. Um, but I don't make so many soups in the winter. In the fall, right before I think it's going to freeze, I'll make some soups and put my last lovage in it, both the leaves and the stems, because I just love the flavor so much. So remember lovage. Then there's our favorite mint. So one thing about mint is the Monkla History Center usually sells several varieties. And it might be fun to try some, like there's different ones. There's a chocolate mint that I've grown and then put in fruit salads. Mint actually is one that prefers partial shade, but it will also grow in the bright sun. I actually had a pot of mint and I'm gonna do this again out in my front yard by the road with a sign to my neighbors, please feel free to take. Um, my, my daughter had, there was a mint pot like that in DC. So I decided to do it here and share my mint. And that was bright sun and it grew fine. The main thing about mint is you do not want to put it directly into the ground generally because it can be very, um, very aggressive in the way it, it spreads. I had a neighbor who was part Greek and one spring she said, I am Greek, I love mint. I can't have too much mint. I'm gonna use it as a ground cover. By the fall, she said, I am Greek and I can't have too much mint. <laughs> it spread too much. So I always urge people to grow mint in a pot, either above ground, or you could put it in a pot and sink it into the ground too, if you want to do that. I used to do that, but I now just like having this pot of my mint. Um, and even in the pot, it will come back. I put the pot in the garage, not so much for the mint. It could have stayed outside all winter, but so the pot wouldn't get broken. Um, and then it will come, it's coming back. And you can use mint in the Middle Eastern salad tabbouleh. You can use it in salads. I think it's really nice in the savory salads. I had that years ago in a pizza place. They had a salad. I said, what makes a salad so good? And they had mint in it. You can use it as a marinade for chicken. You can use it in fruit desserts. So many, many uses for that. Then another perennial is oregano. It's um, kind of a more woody, uh, it's kind of almost a cross between the woodies and the soft because it's very soft stem, but it is a perennial. You only need one plant. It also grows very well and spreads, but not as aggressively as mint. It prefers full sun. It's really great with tomato dishes, as you probably know. I also just love to cook it like you get too much zucchini off in the summer. So just saute onions and zucchini and oregano is a great dish. It's also a really nice um, chicken mar marinade. The famous recipe of chicken Marbella has oodles of um, uh, oregano in it and you marinate it overnight. So here's sage, which someone talked about in the beginning. Um, it's another nice woody perennial. And you can see this is what after it overwintered in my garden. And then this is later in the season. And it is the person mentioned that they cut it back. It's good to cut it back in the spring so it gets bushier. In general, if you prune a plant, it will get bushier. So after in the spring, before I pruned it, it looked like this. And then later in the summer, it looked like this because I had pruned it. Um, I, the sage is like a bush. You only need one. Um, and I had it in my herb garden and felt it was getting too big and put it in another place because it likes a, it's a pretty bush. Um, you can use it, a classic combo is a Simon and Garfunkel song, parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme. So of course, sage is sold all over around Thanksgiving. So it really goes well with any poultry. You can actually make sage pesto too. I then suggest you mix it with parsley. Um, and there's a, it's a really nice combo with sweet potato soup in the fall. Uh, and I said in the tips, it really is like a small shrub. So, and I think, you know, one is really all you need and it, it grows back really nicely. So thyme really prefers um, sun. It is um, really something that likes well-drained soil. It can be used as a ground cover. And sometimes herb gardens do that. They like use it as a ground cover in their paths. 
I've tried to do that unsuccessfully because my, the place I was growing was too damp. So it really likes to be um, uh, dry. It has a, the same uses as sage because it's parsley, sage, rosemary, and thyme, um, and very easy to grow. And it, and it comes back easily. So here's a recipe I wanted to give people. Um, Jane, I don't know if you can send this PowerPoint out to people afterwards. If not, you could tell me if you want to unmute mute Jane and tell me if you can, but people could snap a shot of this with their, um, with their phone. This um, is just an unusual different way to use a bunch of herbs to basically roast cherries, roast cherry tomatoes, sorry, roast cherry tomatoes, and then put a, a topping on them of breadcrumbs and herbs. The original recipe actually called for only parsley. And I just think it's really interesting to use a mix, like a third of a cup of mixed herbs. So this is something I really like to make in August and September when I have a lot of roasted cherries to make roasted cherry, have a lot of cherry tomatoes. And this is a great way to make a side dish of them and use my herbs. And it is just utterly delicious. Okay, I'm going to stop the share here before we go to the annuals and flowers and just see if people have questions. I love mint um, and I do have it in a container, um, but I use it also in the summertime. I just throw it in a pitcher in water in my fridge yes. and sometimes I'll throw some strawberries in there or sometimes I'll throw some lemon in there too. But it just, it makes, it makes drinking water a whole different experience during the summer months, I think. Yes, that's a great idea. I had it in the first slide about uses, but I should add that to the mid slide. Yeah. Very good use of it. Yeah. I, um, have any other questions or comments, Christina? Yes. Um, I have tarragon, which I bought at the uh, herb sale a couple of years now, and it keeps coming back, but the taste has diminished. Interesting. Very much diminished, so much that I, you know, take it off and crush it in my, in my hands, and I'm like, oh, that's tarragon? you know so i just wondered why i don't know i don't grow tarragon myself one thing i might suggest is just um pruning it back a little bit when it comes up um to maybe well, it, it, it's in a planter so it's not you know like a big bush but it's it, it just turned up green and i maybe i'll buy tarragon this time again and yeah try. If you that's interesting because I haven't seen that happen with the other perennial herbs like with sage or mint. Um, I think yeah, it's it's a good support of the history center if that's what you're finding. Just um, uh, you know, buy a new plant. You know, yep, I Thank you for support the that. history center. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, good. Someone just said that they were glad to learn about lovage. That's in addition to to evangelizing about native plants, I evangelize about lovage. <laughs> I love lovage. I people, love who, it. people who know lovage love lovage. Yeah. Um, the other fun thing about lovage that the kids in our farm camp love is that the um, stem is a um, is straw. Hard. So we actually have them cut off the pieces of the stem and then use it as a, as a natural straw. And <laughs> uh, they get such a kick out of that. I remember the way I found out about Lovage was years ago, a friend of mine who's actually written books about nutrition said there's a lot of perennial greens. I said, really, Terry? Like what? Tell me an example of a perennial green. And she goes, Lovage. I said, okay. And that's true. It is a perennial green, but there's not that most of them are not perennial here, like kale and things. She's was, you know, the, she was promoting kale before anyone else. So that's, it's, it's just nice to have those perennials. That's so, that's the same thing with native plants that come up. You get all your friends greeting you in the spring without doing any work, you know? Yeah. I also, I also have um, something called what I call walking onion or Egyptian onion, which I think it's in the herb. Uh, it's in garden. the herb garden. Yes. Yeah. And it, it just multiplies all over my front yard. And um, I haven't used it yet, but I realized I can use it like scallion. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, and, and Jane, if anybody from your side is interested in digging any of this up and selling it, be my guest. Okay. <laughs> yes, it's a media yes, it really is spreading, kind of like her story of the mint. <laughs> yes, exactly. I'm going to chime in. One, I'm the one who's so appreciative of your hint, Lovage. It's just escaped me all these 50 odd years that I've been gardening. So thank you. Um, 
I had a question, which is, do you think that if a plant, an herb plant has lost some of its, you know, pungency and flavor, it might be a sign that there's some absent nutrient that you could research? It could be, especially if it's in a pot, the nutrients tend to leach out over time. So you could give it some organic fertilizer. Um, worm, worm castings are sold sometimes like at Whole Foods or compost. I, that would be a very, that's a very good um, analysis, Carol. But she could also just try buying another one too. And Deborah, you unmuted. Yeah, I just wondered, you know, because there's always some sort of a wild garlic or chivy kind of thing in almost everybody's yard. And we always, is that, this, is that, is that what you're talking about, Christy? Or is that? Can, no, I know she's you can talking. I know what she's talking about. If you look in the herb garden behind the crane house, it, by the end of the summer, it gets all these. It's really interesting. It gets kind of these knobby looking things on it, and then it bends over. And oh. what where it bends roots, and then the next year you get another one from there. But but the, but the, what you see in the yard, that's just regular old chives. It's I mean, not I, either. What you're seeing in the yards is something different. It's kind of a, uh, I'm not sure what it is actually. It's some kind of a weedy onion. You can eat it though. It's out of- Oh yeah, no, I mean, I've I've chopped it up and put it on top of like baked potatoes and stuff just because I'm always promoting the, uh, putting the, what do you call it? The, um, uh, my mom calls it uh, sticks and weeds. Um, that I always cook with, and she hates it. But mm -hmm. I, I like. I, th I thought. I thought it had a kind of a nice taste. Yes, it's. But it isn't actually chives. It's some kind of a wild onion. Okay. Cool. Okay, I'm gonna go back to sharing, and then we'll do more questions at the end. Okay. So basil. So now we're into the annuals. So of the annuals, um, basil's first alphabetically, but it's actually my favorite herb to. Um, I guess if I had to choose, if I was on a desert island and only could have one thing, it would be basil over lovage, although I do love lovage, as you know. But basil is just so great with pesto. It's so flavorful. And there are many varieties. The, herb, the um, History Center usually sells several varieties. Um, Genovese is the variety if you mostly want to use it for pesto. Um, it is something that really needs to be warm. You cannot... Um, you can grow from seed, by the way, but I usually come and get the plants. Um, but you want to wait until it's past frost time to plant. We're getting some really warm weather right now. So, you know, the plant, the herb sale is well timed to be warm enough. Of course, you can use it and it with it just goes so well with all kinds of tomato things as well as hot dishes. Um, you can make pesto and freeze it in little cubes, the same cube, I, you, I sh you can use either an ice cube tray or little things. And that's a great thing then to add, uh, have in the winter to put in soups, or I even just used a bunch of that. I had a few of them and I used it to make pesto sandwiches with tomatoes for um, my niece's wedding, um, for the brunch after the wedding. So on this picture shows how it's kind of, um, you can see those little leaves and flowers. To make it more productive, you should pinch off the flowers. And in any herbs, it's better to take off the flowers because it'll produce more pungent leaves and more leaves. In terms of vegetable gardening, they have there's a lot of people who talk about companion plants, the plants you should plant with other vegetable plants to deter insects and increase root growth. And basil and tomatoes are great companion plants. So I used to plant all my basil in one place and now I mix it among my tomatoes. Um, so I think that's a really cool thing to know about. Um, the, uh, um, the other thing about basil is one year I wanted so much pesto. My daughter's vegan and she loves my pesto because it's vegan. And um, I have been known to make like many, many batches, like 50 to 60 batches of pesto in a summer. And I planted too much and it was too close together and then it didn't have good air circulation. So basil is prone to mildew. And some years are worse than others. Last year was a kind of a better year, 
So my two techniques for that are don't plant it too close and do harvest it when you can. Because if the mildew starts spreading, you kind of have to throw it out. Um, but some years like last year, we were able to use it into September and October and make pesto for the winter then. Um, sorry, I'm not... Sometimes my, okay. Here's my recipe for low fat pesto. I've been using this recipe for 30 years or more. And it's just a great recipe. The only difference between normal recipes is that it uses um, lemon juice and olive oil. So it's a little bit less fat, so it's a low fat, but I also think the lemon juice gives lots of flavor. Um, it's very adaptable in that you could use the traditional pignoli nuts or walnuts, which are a lot cheaper. Um, I do think sometimes the pignoli nuts or pine nuts do taste a little better, but I also think with all that garlic and basil, you can barely taste the difference. And if you do freeze it, um, then add the, the Parmesan cheese afterwards. I don't um, put in Parmesan cheese because of my vegan daughter. As I said, the pesto freezes very well for winter use. It's the best way to preserve um, basil. So here's one of my pesto little jars. I unfroze two or three of them for this wedding. And then you can see how I did these little uh, tea sandwiches with basil and um, tomato. What a way to brighten up you know, a March day or a February day or an April day when we don't have much in the garden yet. So parsley, I love to grow parsley and I've had very poor luck with mine because of the rabbits. Um, but I think it's, a, it's easy to grow and in some places it can be, it can overwinter sometimes. I have not had such good luck with it overwintering. There's many, many uses for it, and it's just a great thing to grow. Um, there's basically two kinds, the flat parsley or the curly, and they taste very similar. So I think it's just a matter of individual preference. This is one that can grow in a little less than full sun, but it doesn't want to be in deep shade. Rosemary. Rosemary um, in other climates can really overwinter and it might overwinter in some people's backyards here if you have like a little microclimate that's warm near a house. I'm always amazed when I travel and see big bushes like in Mexico of rosemary. Here we normally need to buy it every year, better for the Montclair History Center's fundraising. Um, so I always buy a nice plant and it does, it grows well all through the winter. And um, it really, because it's from the Mediterranean, really wants good drainage and can be used with, I've already mentioned several things, the classic combos of using um, rosemary with poultry. And then I'm gonna um, tell you about a special way to use it, which is my lemon rosemary shortbread. So in preparation, actually for something else, I just was in my freezer 15 minutes before this talk. I said to my husband, there was a delightful surprise. I didn't realize I had another container of my lemon roast um, shortbread. I just, we hosted my niece's wedding and we used a lot of cookies in my freezer and these were left over, I didn't realize. So here's the, um, here is the um, Deb Ellis version of the lemon rosemary shortbread. The original um, version um, had a little bit less herbs and flavoring. So I've reduced the butter and flour and sugar um, and to increase the flavor. So this is really lemony and rosemary and people love it. It has a lot of words, but it's basically mixing the butter and sugar together, adding the dry ingredients and the flavorings. And then you, I put it in a log roll and saran wrap actually, chill it for 30 minutes, and then I just cut off slices. Um, I gave some to my vegan daughter. I made some vegan for her and she goes, well, mom, I don't really know if I like it because it's like a blend. It's kind of like bread. It's kind of like a cross between a bread and a cookie. I said, that's what it's supposed to be. But most people love this. And I do think it's a little better with real butter than vegan butter because you really can taste the butter. So I also wanted to talk about draw, drying herbs for um, teas. That's another way to extend the gardening season um, and it's really nice to have your, um, your herbs with you in the winter time. I've already talked about how you can dry them. You can hang them up, but you can just lay them on a tray too. And this is um, lemon verbena here. That is going to be the next thing I talk about. So lemon verbena, I would say, if you have never tried 
this. This would be the top thing to try at the Montclair History Center sale this year, other than Lovage. So I would say Lovage is the most unusual herb that people don't know about. That's a perennial and lemon verbena is an annual. You do have to grow it every year. I recommend getting more than one plant actually because it's so good. Um, and it's really great to put into water. Like that's another use for to like flavor your water with it. You can, it's a great cocktail garnish. You can use it in cookies. You can make tea out of it, fresh tea in the summer or dry it and have tea um, in the winter. It's a delightful ending to a summer meal to have some fresh ver um, lemon verbena tea um, and also tea bread. So, and the tea is more than, than lemon alone. That's why it's so interesting. I think there's something about herbs that they just have a little oil in them in a good sense, like lemon verbena and basil. And that just makes the, the flavor so interesting. Uh, I would never try to grow this from seed. That's why it says grow from plants. So here's another tea, um, a tea um, plant, which is also native. So as I'm getting to the end, I'm gonna talk about some flowers and some of them are native. So this is not a annual, this is a perennial. I don't know if the History Center is selling this. Are you, Jane? We are, yes. You are, great. Okay, Fingers wonderful. Fingers crossed they arrive, but they're on the order yeah, yeah. So let me just give a little pitch on native plants. I do a lot of talks on native plants. I'm the head of the Native Plant Society for our county and the vice president for the state. The idea of native plants is that they are the plants that were here before the colonists arrived. They eco-evolved with our insects and our animals. And so by planting native plants, we can help restore the biodiversity that is really declining in North America and the world. The world is living through a climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis. But the biodiversity crisis is something we can all help by planting a few native plants. And a big example of that is milkweed. You may have heard that monarchs need milkweed. Monarchs, because they co-evolved with milkweed, will only lay their eggs on milkweed. And so without milkweed, there will be no monarchs. And people are learning that and planting more and more milkweed. Um, milkweed is not something that's edible to us, so it's not in this presentation, but there are some native plants that are also edible. And so those are some of the ones that I'm putting into this presentation. If any of you like Earl Grey tea, then you might be familiar with this name of bergamot, which is one of the common names for this plant Monarda. It has most, many plants have more than one common name. This has the name of bee balm or bergamot. Bergamot is a flavoring in Earl Grey tea. So it's a very nice plant to use um, either the flowers or the leaves for tea. Um, I remember as a little girl, I used to suck on the nectar in this when I was a kid. Um, so anyway, there's purple um, bergamot and there's red. Um, it prefers uh, sun, um, but it can also grow in light shade. So that's a nice thing to think about to make an herb garden or your just general garden um, very, you can see this is a little skipper here to, to attract the, um, the wildlife to your garden and also be good for you. Here's a beautiful example of this, the yellow, the tiger yellow swallowtails on my bergamot in the summertime. So marigold is not a native plant, but it's a great plant for an herb garden because the, um, both the leaves and the flowers are edible. A few years ago at the Montclair History Center sale, I bought the lemon um, and orange gem, which have a mild citrus flavor and they're a little more delicate leaves. I don't normally use the leaves of traditional marigolds, but on those I did because they were um, more delicate. And the marigold flowers are beautiful garnishes to put into salads. People who are my friends and family know, like if you come to my house, you're gonna get flowers in your salad, just be, go with it. Um, they're also a great companion plant for vegetable gardens. They deter the bad insects and welcome the, the beneficial insects. So it's a great thing to plant with your tomatoes and your basil. Um, and the Mako History Center usually has several varieties. I think Jane mentioned she's having a little trouble getting them this year. They but, were hopeful uh, that they will be here. Let's okay, put it that great. way. Okay. The nasturtiums are another great edible flower. Again, a perennial, uh, an annual, sorry, like marigolds are annuals. 
um, and they have to be bought every year. They can be grown from seed, but I do like getting the um, I like getting them from the Montclair History Center because it's just easier. And this is something where you can really eat the the leaves and the flowers. As I I have bunnies and uh, groundhogs in my backyard. That I cannot really grow lettuce, but they don't eat my, because of a little pungent taste, they don't eat the leaves of this. So I often add this, the, the nasturtium means in, I think a native um, indigenous language to Mexico, it means watercress, and that's what it tastes like. These prefer nutrient poor soil. So don't um, fertilize where you, if you want to have a lot of foliage and flowers. Same with rosemary. Rosemary does like nutrient poor soil, soil also. So then the, um, I think this might be my last flower. Let me see. Yeah, no, I have two, one more. Okay. So I always want to tell people to um, give love to violets. I don't think that we're selling violets. Most people have them in their yards in New Jersey. It's our state flower and also of Rhode Island, Illinois, and Wisconsin, where I grew up. But people don't know that you can actually eat the leaves all summer long. Again, the groundhogs don't eat them. The rabbits nibble at them, but they leave plenty for me. And you can eat the flowers. So they're blooming right now. You can eat the flowers. Um, you can put them in ice cubes and put them in water. And that looks pretty, although it looks a little weird when the ice cubes melt. <laughs> um, so I tried that one year and it didn't work out so well. Um, they, leaves can also be used like spinach. I don't normally do that, but they it has a little mucilaginous quality and can thicken soup too. I just usually add them to my salads. Like I have some lettuce and I'll add some watercress and some violet leaves. Um, they make a really nice ground cover in a garden. And the reason I want people to know about these and not pull them all out, um, instead cultivate them and support them is they are a host plant for 29 species of butterflies and moss. So what do you mean by host plant? That is what milkweed is to monarchs. It means it's a plant that the butterfly has co-evolved with and will lay their eggs on. And many of our natives will, mo I'm sorry, most of our butterflies will not lay their eggs on any introduced plant. So we have all these beautiful plants around town like tulips and daffodils and lilacs. All of those are barren ecologically. It's sad to say, but it's true. None of them support biodiversity. None of our insects will lay, plant, lay their eggs on them or eat them, but they will for the violets. And in fact, it's a host for the fritillary butterfly. So I wanna show you, there's my little field of violets. And this is my, the fritillary butterfly that came later. I think it's such a beautiful butterfly. It looks a little like a monarch, but it's not. So um, there's a little explanation again of the host plant is where they lay their eggs and then where the insects, um, the caterpillars will eat the plants. So you're gonna find some holes if you're doing a good biodiverse garden and it is Earth Day in a couple of days. Um, then uh, you're going to see some holes in your plant. And if it bothers you, just step a few feet back. And then here's another great native plant. So it's a, all the native plants are perennials. They all come up every year. Purple coneflower, its scientific name echinacea tells you how valuable it is because we've all heard of echinacea tea and echinacea being used medicinally. If you want more purple coneflower, you can see it here in my garden. It's a one to deadhead. Deadhead means cutting off the blooms when they're spent and then they will bloom more because plants want to reproduce. That's also true for marigolds and nasturtiums, by the way. Remember I said in the beginning, use your herbs. The more you pick nasturtiums, the more you pick the marigolds, the more you'll get. Um, so for purple coneflower, it does want sun. It can use a little light shade. Um, it doesn't need fancy soil. The goldfinches, which are state birds, love the seeds. And the use of it for most of us is not something we would put in our salads or something, but you can use the leaves for tea. So where to buy? I always have a where to buy. So here it's the Montclair History Center herb sale. Um, so I think you all know that. And then if there's something they don't have, or if there's something you wanna look for later, 
Another really good source of herbs is Well Sweep Herb Farm in Port Murray, New Jersey, which is a ways away, but is a really interesting place to go. And they have a lot of natives and a lot of interesting herbs. But of course, I urge you to go to the Montclair History Center. And I thank you for that. <laughs> so thank you and eat your greens and eat your um, herbs because they're really good for you. And I'm going to stop sharing and take any other questions or comments. So while you're stopping, I'm going to share a couple things that came up in the chat. Um, one is that Carol said that the parsley caterpillar stripped her whole plant in no time and they were perfectly camouflaged. And Lisa agreed and said the caterpillar comes back to mind every year on the vertical planter on my deck. Anything she can do about that, that caterpillar? You are feeding the eastern swallowtail butterfly. There you go. <laughs> um, which is the state butterfly of New Jersey. And I'm doing this talk again at seven. I'm going to add a slide of the picture of that for people. You are doing the goddess's work. So thank you. Now you maybe don't want the cat. This is what happens when you have caterpillars. You remember that kid's book, The Very Hungry Caterpillar? They are very hungry. <laughs> That's why they're defoliating your parsley. You could put netting over it. You could grow some parsley somewhere else and put netting over it if you want to do that. Um, you know, or grow more. Try to grow more. It happens to me with blueberries. The birds eat them all, and I'm just okay with it. But that is a problem. It's a problem if you think it's a problem. <laughs> it's it's a beautiful thing. That is an example. Parsley is not native. That's an example of a non-native being a host plant for our state butterfly, for the Eastern Swallowtail butterfly, a gorgeous butterfly. And then just I mean, the, a, a the cabbage, the butterflies, those white little cabbage butterflies, which are not native and are not very pretty, they lay their eggs on kale and cabbage plants and they defoliate those too. And then I can't say you're actually helping a native butterfly. So yes, we have to deal with the fact that fact. So uh, Carol did comment on the work and how wonderful it is that you're helping the environment in that way. I have a question for you, and that's about the violet. I have an area under a tree that is very shady and is hard to grow grass. Can I, can violets grow by seed? If I were to just toss some violet seed on there, would it fill in? It would, and even more than that, if you have some plants, you could just, I don't even know if they sell violet seed. I've never seen it being sold. Okay. Um, but Jane, if you want to come to my house and get some violets, I will give you some if you, <laughs> and I know there's, I know there are some at the history center because yeah. I've been giving talks for the kids and I've looked around what you have there. So the thing about violets, I started a native plant garden for a friend two years ago and I was at her house this morning and we're using violets as a ground cover. And yes, that is a great idea to put them under a tree. It's a fantastic idea because okay. they will grow there. And you're doing something, you're making a garden, an edible garden for yourself and helping the fritillary butterflies. So Lisa asks, do they make cocoon, uh, cocoons? I don't know what you're talking about, Lisa. Um, I think she's that... asking, do the caterpillars make cocoons? Yes, oh, they okay. Yes, because caterpillars go through, you know, a butterfly will lay the egg the egg will then, um, you know, develop into a caterpillar, which will then have a cocoon or a chrysalis, which then emerges the butterfly. Yes, they will. You don't always see it. Sometimes you see it, sometimes you don't. The other important thing to know is that caterpillars are the Gerber baby food for birds. One nest of chickadees, which is a very small bird, needs six to 9,000 caterpillars a season to feed one nest of their chicken, of their babies. So sometimes people say, I see these caterpillars, they defoliate my milkweed or my parsley, and then I don't see the butterfly. Well, it's possible a bird ate the caterpillar. So again, you're contributing to the web of life and that's a wonderful thing. I had bronze fennel in my yard last year and I'm not sure what butterfly that was, but my um, backyard was filled with them after uh, I saw the little chrysalis on there. And then within you know a month, I was noticing I had a ton of butterflies in my backyard. Isn't, and isn't that wonderful? I yeah. mean, that's the thing about doing the native gardening. It's creating our own little eco paradise. Not only are we doing something, but it's just so beautiful. It's so beautiful. Like my husband just loves, he calls our backyard and we have a really small backyard, a little paradise, you know? And then if you want to plant some cardinal flowers, you'll have hummingbirds. So, 
but I brought bronze fennel from the Mapa History Center last year too. Um, and, and it, it's a perennial. Yeah. But I don't know a lot about it. I'm like, what do you think is a good use for it? I, I don't know. I just use it. <laughs> it looks pretty. I mean, it's a dark shade yeah. so it sets off the greens around it so um um yeah i i just use it because i think it looks pretty in the garden ornamentally as opposed yeah. to from a culinary perspective mm -hmm. but um we also do have this year some of the monarda we do have some echinacea and i was able to find some small milkweed plugs so we'll have some of those too so uh, we will have a few natives at the at the sale this year as well oh. everybody thank you so much spread the word I, I, she's doing it again tonight and i think there's a lot of really fun information in there so uh, do spread the word and uh, we'll see you um, two weeks from today is the herb sale um, but we're going to be we've got um, an architect who's going to be talking about Georgians, Tudors, and Queen Anne's in Montclair. So uh, should be an interesting talk. So hope to see you again in two weeks. And at Thank the herb sale, of course. Thank you all for coming. And I maybe we'll see some of you at the herb sale. Thank you. <laughs> Take care. Bye-bye.